Well, thank you for enduring a long reading from Ecclesiastes. That was uh, the, the preacher's preference to lengthen it, uh, and uh, it will probably end up shortening the sermon. But there, uh, there is an amazing amount of, uh, of giftedness, I think, in this scripture text that we've worked with the last couple of weeks in Ecclesiastes, and I didn't want to short, uh, short you of it. So we hear this word from the writer of Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And if you didn't catch it the first time, maybe you caught it the second or third or fourth or fifth time. What a way to start a book. What a way to start a sermon. But here we have a word from God. And what kind of truth can we find in it? There is a word of truth here that Ecclesiastes gives to us. A word about life outside of the promise of Christ. But now you have come not just to hear about what life looks like, I know, outside of Christ, but actually be given a word where Christ is delivered. And so I must tell you right up front that Christ has come now into your ears and soon into your mouths as well later in the service so that you will be made free from all of the vanities in this world, actually free to enter into them, whatever they look like in your life. And so that you know that they will not be your peace, but Christ is. This is now the freedom he's working in your lives this day. So the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The Hebrew word for vanity, which is used many times in Ecclesiastes, also has a connotation of chasing after the wind. And I don't know if you've ever chased after the wind, but you can never quite capture it. Now, maybe if you have a sailboat, that's about as well, as as good as you can do, capturing the wind. But even there, you can never get it completely. And so this writer of Ecclesiastes, sometimes thought to be Solomon, More recently, uh, not thought to be Solomon, but for, for our sake today, we'll call the writer of Ecclesiastes Solomon because it sounds a lot like him, this most successful guy in the history of the world who had everything he could ever want and more, who was, well, given all that his body desired. And here we have this writing that says, all of it, vanity. Well, what are we to make of this? This chasing after the wind. Maybe you can relate to Solomon. Maybe not, but I have a question for you. What is it that you chase after in your lives? What is it when you go home from church now this afternoon that will consume your mind? Perhaps a to-do list. If you're anything like me, It's probably true. Perhaps things coming up this week that you must accomplish. Or maybe there are larger things, concerns that you have, health concerns or concerns for others that you love, that you are consumed with. Well, if we are to believe Solomon here in the book of Ecclesiastes, we are to learn that all of these things, positive and negative, finally result in vanity. And this doesn't seem like a real positive word for us to begin a sermon with or to base a worship service around. What are we to make of it? Well, Solomon himself tells us a a bit about his troubles. He says, I will make a test of pleasure. Now we live in a culture where pleasure is put up on quite a high pedestal, where we work so that we can have pleasure. And Solomon says, well, I tried it all. Laughter, it is mad. Pleasure, what use is it? I cheered my body with wine. And here we can see that Solomon even tried drunkenness, perhaps, to lay hold of the folly during the few days of life. And he said it did not work. It did not bring peace. And then he moved on to something else that might sound a little more wise to us. He said, I tried great works. 
I built houses and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted fruit trees. And I have to say that there is something very attractive about planting a fruit tree, though I have never been successful at this. I have tried to plant an apple tree, which died the next year. There is still something to me that seems quite nice about having an apple tree in the backyard, where you can collect your own Honeycrisp apples and make apple pie. Now, this sounds like the epitome of pleasure to have an apple tree, but Solomon here tells me and tells us that even this was vanity. He had slaves, which isn't something that we uh, can get our minds around completely, but what we can see is that Solomon had people to do things for him, which is something that I think we all like from time to time. Someone to do tasks for us. He said, this didn't do any good for me. Solomon says, I had great possessions, herds and flocks more than any that came before me in Jerusalem. I had silver and gold, treasures of the kings. And not only that, but I had singers as well. I had a beautiful choir, men and women. And you have to admit that there is, it is hard to beat the sound of a beautiful choir. And Solomon continues, this did not help me. And I had the delights of my flesh, Solomon says, many concubines. And here we can see too in our culture that this is something that seems to be, well, what many would want. But Solomon, who had it all, said, no, this did not bring me peace. And finally, in verse 11, he says this, and I invite you to think of those pursuits that consume your life from time to time. Solomon says, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it. And again, all was vanity and a chasing after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And at this point, you may wonder, where is this going? I say, whoa. Woe is us. This is truly despair that Solomon is writing about. Having all of these things, these great joys and gifts in his life, all of it, ending in despair? Is this what we have to look forward to in life? And we might hope that there is something, uh, a little help from the Gospels. We might think that, and so we go and hear Jesus teaching, and what does he do but tell us a parable this morning about the man who had much wheat, much crop in his farmland and he built bigger barns. And Jesus said, and he said to himself, and I love this line in the gospel, the man said to his soul, speaking to his own soul, he said, soul, you have ample goods now, laid up for many years, so you can relax and eat and drink and be merry. And it sounds like a sensible thing that this man has done in the parable. Yet what does Jesus say next? He says, you fool, did you not know that tomorrow your life will end? And what good is all of this stored up for you? And so while we might hope that Jesus has a word for us here in the gospel that would be of help, it only seems to pile on the despair. I had a uh, a couple weeks uh, away from the office this month. One week I was at a family camp near Alexandria, Minnesota, listening to a couple of my favorite theologians. Uh, and for me, this was uh, pure pleasure, pure fun. Uh, they were teaching on the stories of Genesis. And then the next week, well, this past week, I traveled with my brother and stepson, to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And any of you who know airplanes or who like airplanes know that this week at Oshkosh, Wisconsin is the greatest fly-in in the world where 10,000 airplanes merge at this airport and 30, 40,000 people camp out and just live 
and breathe airplanes. And I've been going to this uh, since I was a young kid with my, with my own family, with my mom and dad. And it's a beautiful place. There, uh, I don't know if you heard on the news at Oshkosh, there were a couple of newsworthy things that happened. One was that Jetman, Eve Rossi is his name, flew for the first time publicly uh, in front of a crowd in the United States. And here's this man who has developed a little jet suit with a wing that he wears with a couple of small jet engines and he goes up on a helicopter or a hot air balloon and jumps off and he pushes his throttle and starts to fly just with the controlling his flight just with the movement of his arms and his head and his feet. Well, it sounds kind of crazy probably to most of us, but to him this, this is freedom, he says. Well, that was one thing that happened at Oshkosh. Another was uh, the public flight of a flying car called the Terrafugia. And the Terrafugia is something that you can actually legally drive on the road and with the press of a button, the wings fold out like this and you can fly. Right over the traffic is what they told us. (laughs) You can wave at the gridlock down below. (laughs) And if you've ever tried to get through the Twin Cities on a Friday night or a Sunday night, you might appreciate that as well. Well, it sounds like freedom. And Oshkosh is full of this rhetoric, which I've been steeped in my whole life, that flying is freedom. Now, I'm not actually so interested in those things, but I love to go and look at some of the vintage aircraft and the World War II uh, planes that have been lovingly restored. Some of them hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Not hundreds of hours, not thousands of hours, some of them tens of thousands of hours in the making. And there are signs that say, you can look, but please do not touch. You know that these airplanes are loving, uh, well, almost creatures of their owners and restorers. And they are a sight to behold, whether on the ground or in the sky. One of the performers there, Sean Tucker, who is a very famous aerobatic performer, likes to talk about how his arms become his wings. And he is freed from the, you know this phrase, the surly bonds of earth. But even here, even in Oshkosh, I find that after a couple of days, this is not my freedom either. It may be the seeds of dreams, but it does not free me. And I know it does not free even the jet man or Sean Tucker or the owners of these beautiful airplanes. But that finally Solomon's words come true and all is vanity. So what is the answer? If if these things are all vanity, should we just ignore them? Life, possessions, works. Should we sell all of our things and give them to the poor? Well, yes. Jesus actually teaches this. And that might give us pause, (laughs) especially at Oshkosh. But even this will not make peace in your life. So Christ must enter in in a different way. And so he does in forgiveness. Because we, like Solomon, have tried so hard to find joy and peace on our own terms, in our own ways, outside of God's word. But now Christ frees us actually to enter into the material world, to the world of possessions, taking our idolatry right away from us. Because now all of these things, these things that Solomon calls vanities, whether they are the works of your hand, your wisdom, perhaps your airplane, uh, whether they are your pursuits for joy, now they are put in their proper place not as things that will actually bring peace, but as gifts that God has given so that you can enjoy them and not 
and be freed from them and not be controlled by them. So now you know that your peace will not come from being successful enough or rich enough or prepared enough or even nice enough or wise enough. And you can stop wondering why these attempts haven't brought you what you expected. In fact, God will use you up in such pursuits. Not to make peace for you, surprisingly, but actually to help others to serve those around you. As Solomon observed, and this may be our greatest nightmare when we hold on to our possessions, Solomon observes this. He says, and then when I die, all of my things will go to someone else. And they maybe don't deserve them at all. They maybe were not wise and did not work for them at all. This becomes the nightmare of those who have worked so hard for what they've attained. But now know that Jesus has come to repent you of all of this. And now his perfect life, the only life of perfection that was ever lived, now he gives to you freely. And just as Solomon predicted, you who do not deserve it, and me who does not deserve it, now we are given this perfect life and now you are made perfect apart from any of your things and accomplishments but in Christ alone. Amen.